our first TEDx event hosted by Summit Quest. Thank you, Ms. Stephanie, for organizing this amazing event for us. Now, TED, this TEDx event is going to be six special students who have been chosen to talk about their topics and things they are passionate about. First up is Lily James, who will be talking about women's rights in the big picture. Women's rights. What are they and why are they important? It's a highly controversial topic. Today, I'm going to be talking about the bigger picture. To start off, we're going to talk about dress code. Dress code is a very common subject of scrutiny. It mostly targets women, even if we don't admit that. And by targeting women, I mean they almost never see a guy wearing spaghetti straps or tank tops or short shorts. You don't see that. And if they want to wear that, then that is their choice. But it is mostly targeted towards women. And if you go into the shop for a tank girl and you go to the aisle that we get our clothes at, then you'll see that it's very hard to find clothes that are school appropriate. So this represents the issue of catcalling. Catcalling is a form of harassment. Harassment that is no good. Catcalling is um, men calling out to women about their bodies. 95% of women say they are victims of honking and whistling. 95% of women say they are victims of leering. 85% of women say they are victims of a sexist comment. And 80% say they are victims of a vulgar gesture. This is not okay. Women are seen as the weaker gender. And that can really hurt someone's mental health. Not to mention, there are many standards that go along with being a woman. Are you too pale or too tan? Are you thin enough? Are you too fat? There's a lot of standards that we have to live up to. And this is only amplified by magazines like GQ, Style, Harper's Bazaar, and Vogue. You don't see plus size models on those covers. You see perfect women. And when I say perfect, I mean up to the norm, up to the social standards. And that's not okay, because all women are beautiful. And if you look at that, and let's create a scenario. A overweight woman goes into a grocery store. These grocery stores often have magazines in them. These magazines show women who are up to social standards. If a woman looks at that long enough, it can really affect her mental health and her self-worth. Because she's going to look at that and she's going to think, I'm not good enough. And if you look at that long enough, it can lead to depression and eventually suicide. 30.33% of all women are suicide in suicide the US. And that's not okay. And when we talk to victims of these family members, they said that these women committed suicide because they were discriminating against. It's heartbreaking. This leads into how women are treated on the school scale. And while those two topics may not sound related, they are. There are women's needs, meaning that we think women are weaker than men because therefore they can't play on the same team. It's not at all true. There are many examples of men and women working on the same team and going fine. For example, horseback riding. Horseback riders work together as teams, such as polo or baton, and it doesn't matter what their gender is. There are only age divisions, not gender divisions. While you don't see these people attacking each other after a game, you can look at many examples. There are so many more examples of this. But for big things like football and soccer, there are different gender divisions. And that's not okay. This leads into how women are discriminated against for being smart. Einstein's wife, Mary, she was a very smart woman. As we all know, Einstein was a great mathematics. He came up with the gravity thing, but that's really the great discovery. And his wife, Mary, helped him with almost all of his math questions. But she was a genius. But you couldn't tell the public that these were her ideas she was a woman. And being a woman meant that she'd be discriminated against and wouldn't get the funding she needs to continue her chemistry or whatever she wanted to do. She's an unrecognized co-author of Einstein's 1905 relativity paper. 
that changed the outlook on science for years to come. Even though women are often discriminated against in the workplace and everywhere else, I wonder what is because I've been talking about what is isn't in most social standards. But what is feminine? Is it color paint? Is it staying home and taking care of the children? Is it cleaning the house and cleaning the dishes and eating dinner? Because if that's what you think it is, it's not the 1700s. It's the war. When I ask you this question, I want you to think about what feminine means to you. Not just a girl that you know, just feminine in general. What I would answer is it is genius, it is power, it is strength. But what many people would answer it is weakness, it is the worst gender. That's not fair. Women are just as powerful as men, this is shown in so many ways. And yet we are harassed, catcalling, we are mistreated in workplaces, which can lead to a lot of mental health issues. And lastly, women are seen sometimes as crazy wanting to pursue a career in science. We just elected our first Vice President Kamala Harris, a female. And that is a breaking point for America. It's great. But why hasn't this happened before? It's because people who are female and run for an office are often seen as weak. Or people just don't really think about them. Because we tend to vote with people to we tend to vote people with a lower voice, with a deeper voice. Women naturally have higher voices, which also puts our um, sound for getting elected. In 2016, Hillary Clinton was not elected. In my opinion, this is because she was a smart woman. People are afraid of putting smart women in the industry, especially as a commander in chief. But again, I ask you, what is feminine to you? Because if you can't outline what is feminine, you can't outline what is. Thank you, Lily. And next up, we have Thea, who will be talking about the dilemma with social media. First day of school, a big goal. New grade, new age, perhaps. Wait a minute. You look around. And you see all your friends are different. Like, probably something you've never seen before. And then you check again. Everyone looks the same. What's going on, you think to yourself? Is this a trend because it looks like one? It's like people these days are not being like, it's like people these days are like dressing like, like what the trends are. It's like people can't be themselves or like dress whatever they like. It even comes to personalities. Hearing people talk, kind of dress and look that everyone sounds the same. Look, what I'm trying to say is there's no uniqueness or everyone being their kind of one. And it's changed for the worst. Just hearing people talk, drives me to anger because everyone sounds the same. What I'm trying to say, I want to find a message. The world is not on your phones. Go outside and go on your screen for once. Try to get good at one of your talents or something, like drawing, making sports, or even being creative from the time. You can do a challenge on yourself. Go 24 hours or some time without your phone and see how you feel afterwards. In fact, looking at your phone a lot reduces melatonin in your eyes. And that makes you lose sleep. And no one wants to lose their precious sleep. Well, what about myself? Well, I only use my phone for listening to music and fast most of it. And I get it. As a team myself, I do get bored sometimes, and I like to go on my phone once in a while. Sometimes I believe this generation of teens and kids are more drawn to social media than adults and elders. So hear me out. One or some advantages of social media is contacting your loved ones or putting your brand out there. Putting your brand out there is super amazing and helping you. People get to know who you are and become your friends. 
the disadvantages is that you're on your phone, talking to someone, like looking down. And there's no real human interaction anymore. So I think we should put our social media into a bit of a mix. I was pushing, I know, but do we really want a future of this whole generation looking down our phones and screens? And there is really no conclusion to this talk. It's your choice. Look, I'm sure not force, I'm not I'm not forcing you to ever use your devices or social media ever again. I'm just suggesting the best for this world and self. Thank you, Bea. Next up, we have Demetrius, who will be talking about drug abuse. Hello, my name is Demetrius, and you, and we'll be talking about drug abuse. Drug abuse is something that is mentioned in a incredibly negative light and should be perceived as something very negative. But the way we teach our youth about it is fundamentally flawed. Originally, narcotics were created for different purposes, either besides recreational consumption. Drugs such as LSD were created as a mistake. Cocaine and heroin were created as medicines. And methamphetamines were created by the Nazis during World War II as a way to keep their soldiers energized on the front line. But as wars progressed and medicine advanced, these drugs were uh, stopped being used for their original purpose, less and less, and started being used for recreational. And surprise, surprise, when you start regularly consuming something that gives such high levels of dopamine, you would develop an addiction to it for you. This eventually became noticed by countries all around the world. And on June 18, 1977, under President Richard Nixon, the war on drugs was officially declared. This is a very important moment in history to be recognized as it was recognized as a huge failure by the American government and governments across the world for multiple reasons. One very proper reason being the DARE program itself, which failed incredibly bad at teaching the youth about drug use. There was also a very large political agenda behind the war on drugs, such as trying to take on bigger heads in the anti-war movements and civil war movements. By flooding their communities before making the drugs illegal and then decriminalizing them as soon as their communities were flooded by it, allowing the government to stage false crimes on these uh, political figures. It is also very important to acknowledge how drug abuse has actually started. And that it, unlike what uh, these horrible reasons fix them to show, it's not usually by peer pressure, it's more usually brought up in a very casual sense. So it's very important to acknowledge the difference in an addiction. As a difference in addiction to cannabis is different uh, to an addiction to black heart heroin. The most important part, in my opinion, would be the horrible, the horribly inaccurate media depictions about drugs. They do not uh, depict how drugs are properly brought in, how the addictions differ from what to do. One example being how for years people believed that cannabis was a gateway drug. This is not true and has been uh, debunked by multiple studies. One showing that cannabis is a lot less in levels of dopamine and affects different parts of the mind than heroin does. It's also very important to acknowledge that once you originally take the drug for the first time, your body immediately starts building a tolerance. Therefore, your dopamine levels that you will receive from the same drug you that drug will not be the same the next time you take. A lot of these media depictions also include religious backing. This is a horrible idea, as what it does is it one excludes a ton of other religions, and it's usually in this case it was mostly Christianity, therefore it depicted Christianity and only reached that audience. And two, in no religion from my research that I've gathered, that taking any form of narcotics is against the God that they worship. And the issue with this is that if you're preaching to one group, that knows the ins and outs of their religion or biblical text, you're going to know that whatever you, you said about the asking against God is completely false, and you will immediately lose credibility towards that group. A very large thing that I would like to mention is the misrepresentation of drug addicts. A while ago, you may have remembered, if you have ever seen any of that, any of these media depictions or were live at that time, that there was a very popular uh, 
had been ran by the DARE program, which was that a DARE officer was locked in a room with Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and a drug addict, and a gun to bullets. The depiction was that he would use those bullets to get rid of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, and then kill the drug addict. This was poorly flawed, as what it did was show that the drug addicts were beyond help, which is completely not true. From what I heard and personal experience from other people, drug addicts are not beyond help, and there's multiple organizations that are dedicated to helping drug addicts, such as one that is very popular known as NA or Narcotics Anonymous, who have succeeded multiple times in reforming addicts. It was also incredibly inaccurate about peer pressure, as in most of these media depictions at the time, it was usually a very important skit of everybody surrounding one person trying to peer pressure them into consuming narcotics. They also provide no actual advice for what to do in these situations, besides the one little skit to say of saying no, which again would not work in any situation. The production is also very, very horrendous in these, as it is a very drab and more sad and the serious tone, which would have usually worked if the message was being preached properly. But the way that they were preaching with such a no tolerance uh, attitude completely misses the mark and just makes it way easier to be criticized and to make a point. The advice that is provided there is again horrible, as saying no will not save you in any situation. And now that you know what makes these media depictions incredibly bad, this is what I believe a proper media depiction of propaganda would look with this information in mind. The depicts how drugs are actually properly introduced into a setting. It, most of the time it is completely casual, not in a very peer pressure way, to be brought up completely normally. Secondly, offer actual advice of what to do if you're ever in that situation. Be, not, be informed on what it is, as if you've seen any of the horribly uh, inaccurate information from that time, they feel they have complete misinformation stuff inside of these depictions and websites. So become acknowledge, become knowledge of what is actually being consumed by yourself and what is brought into your setting. And within that mind, decide what would be the best course of action for yourself to take. And finally, encourage rehab. Rehab is a very important thing, and again, a point I would love to make across, the drug addicts are not beyond help. Drug addicts are people too, and have always been able to reform. They're, like I said before, this does not all, this has incredible organizations like Narcotics Anonymous, which are dedicated to reforming addicts. This also does not span just under narcotics. This also spans across alcohol gambling, such as groups such as AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, who will also help struggling alcoholics be reformed in ways that we need to society. Thank you for your time. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. And now, our next talk will be Sienna Robertson, who will talk about ocean pollution and its solutions. One second. What do we usually think when we hear the words ocean pollution? Is it just garbage in the ocean? Oil spills or chemical waste? Well, it's many different factors that have become one global environmental crisis for the ocean and the planet. So, what is ocean pollution? What does that have to do with humans? Are we coming up with solutions? And why do we have to stop it? Before we answer all these questions, we need to understand the critical role the ocean has for life on planet Earth. The ocean covers 72% of planet Earth's surface and 97% of the planet's water, which is about 1.35 billion cubic kilometers or 324 million cubic miles of water. From space, all that water makes the Earth appear blue. 
hence the name Blue Planet. Earth is the only planet in our solar system that contains liquid water, and a lot of it. The ocean produces over half of the world's oxygen and absorbs 50 times more carbon dioxide than our atmosphere. The ocean keeps a carbon cycle that works to regulate our climate by transporting heat from the equator to the poles. This function keeps temperatures on Earth in control. In many ways, the ocean controls our environment. The ocean soaks up the heat from the poles to the tropics and transports the warm water from the equator to the poles, where the waters get cold. Then the cold water moves from the poles to the tropics. Without these currents, the weather will be extreme in some regions and fewer places will be habitable. It also regulates rain and droughts. Most of the rain on land comes from the ocean, so it is very important we keep it that way. How is the ocean responsible for getting 70% of the planet's oxygen? Have you ever seen trees in the ocean? No, right? Well, that's because the ocean uses plants, such as seagrass, which are similar to the plants on land. They have roots, stems, and leaves. Algae is a type of aquatic organism that can photosynthesize sunlight. Large algae, such as kelp, are called seaweed. A big way of creating our oxygen here is phytoplankton, microscopic marine algae. The name comes from the Greek words phyton, meaning plant, and plantos, meaning wanderer or drifter. They are impressive little creatures, and they are autotrophs, meaning that they produce their own food, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins using carbon dioxide generally from light energy photosynthesis. There are about 5,000 species of phytoplankton known to man, and they are not only responsible for half of the photosynthetic activity on Earth, making oxygen, but they're also major producers of marine life as part of the food chain. Small fish and some larger species of fish and whales consume phytoplankton as their main food source. In other words, phytoplankton is super important in the making of oxygen and keeping the food chain in balance. Another vital role of the ocean is its abundant diversity of life, with what we can see and those we can't. The diversity is so vast that there is more life below the ocean surface than on land. Experts predict that there are more than 300,000 different species underwater. And scientists keep finding new species all the time, and it's still unclear how many more species there are to find. Sea life is extremely important for global biodiversity and plays an essential role in the food chain web of the Earth's ecosystem. Ocean life diversity provides a food source to many species of animals, from ocean, land animals, and humans. For humans, the ocean also provides commerce and culture. We have created full commerce systems in fishing and maritime transportation. These industries create thousands of jobs worldwide. Fisheries catch more than 90 million tons of seafood each year, including more than 100 species of fish and shellfish. So, what constitutes ocean pollution? Is it just garbage? Well, ocean pollution is a combination of chemicals and land trash that gets washed thrown or blown into the ocean, resulting in damage not only to the ocean environment, but to the whole planet, affecting every living creature in it, including us, humans. There could be several causes of ocean pollution, but the leading causes include sewage, toxic chemicals from industries, nuclear waste, thermal pollution, plastics, acid rain, and oil spillage. Ocean pollution is so harmful, now the ocean has a floating trash patch the size of Texas. It is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, or GPGP, just from people littering and dumping waste. There are about 5.25 trillion tons of plastic in the ocean alone. Only some plastic lingers on the surface. Other plastic can sink to the ocean bottom, or is so small you can't see it floating around the sea, but it is there, polluting and endangering sea life. It's called microplastic. And it is one reason why it's so hard to clean the ocean. Microplastics are less than five millimeters, 0 0.14 inches in diameter. You cannot hold it, move it, or throw it in its proper place. Microplastic will stay stuck in the water until it disintegrates. And it can take about 450 years for the ocean to terminate a piece of plastic. 
conceptualize how long it will take to dissolve a microplastic. Plastic is extremely harmful to sea life. Fishing nets tangle all types of sea life, like turtles and sharks. Sea animals can mistake plastic for food and eat it. Microplastic is consumed by small organisms too, by plankton. And that plankton is seen by whales, which makes it sick. Microplastic has become part of the food chain that reaches us, humans. This is something to be highly concerned about. Most of the oil pollution in the ocean is not from oil spills. It comes from the oil runoff of cars, buses, motorcycles, lawnmowers, and any other oil and grease that storms drain and creeks wash into waterways and end up into the ocean. Another factor is the offshore oil rigs that pump petroleum, a precious resource. About one quarter of all the oil and natural gas comes from the offshore oil deposits around the world. These rigs release heavy metal cuttings, oil, and drilling fluid into the ocean every day. Many of these waste materials contain pollutants such as toxic chemicals and heavy metal cuttings. Another source of pollution is global warming. This is when carbon dioxide, air pollutants, and greenhouse gases collect in the atmosphere and absorb solar radiation bounced off the Earth's surface. Today, the ocean has to deal with higher carbon dioxide levels, which unbalances the water's pH, making it more acidic. The ocean uses phytoplankton to absorb and process carbon dioxide to then spell out oxygen. At the same time, carbon dioxide uses carbonic acids in the ocean. The higher levels of carbonic acids make ocean acidification, which erodes or risk the shells of animals such as clams, crabs, and corals. The history of humanity is connected with the ocean as a food source, culture, and root for trade and exploration. We still use it for the same reasons. We have ships that carry freight from all kinds of goods. Ports are areas of commerce, creating many different jobs and professions. Business people dealing with import and export goods and services, port workers, boat captains, ship crew, etc., our economy will fail if we do not save the ocean. First, the fisheries will stop working. There will be no edible seafood. Pollution and overfishing have already created a 90% loss of the big predators, and 20% of the coral reef are gone. Our economy will suffer much worse by losing jobs in the fishing and maritime transportation industry if we don't implement solutions to stop pollution. Prevention and cleanup are two key elements to rebuild the marine environment. But we need conscious consumers and companies to stop using so much plastic, especially single-use plastic, like plastic bottles, bags, and straws. This is a challenging mission that will take time, money, and a new social approach to the use of plastic. A United Nations report in 2018 says that 60 countries have enacted regulations to limit or ban the use of disposable items. We need to take steps to a healthier future. We can all contribute by making smart and educated decisions, like the limited use of plastics. Recycling helps keep plastic out of the ocean and reduces the amount of new plastic in circulation. Avoid products with plastic microbeads by looking for polyethylene and polypropylene on the ingredient labels. They can be found in some types of toothpaste, body washes, face scrubs. This has become a growing ocean pollution problem as they quickly enter the ocean through the sewer system. We should try to use some polyethylene free and polypropylene free items. Toothpaste especially, because some toothpaste still won't find the plastics in their ingredients today. That means you're putting plastics in your body, and your teeth may not be as clean as some plastic toothpaste. Scientists and other experts hope the ocean will be used more widely as a renewable energy source. Some countries have already harnessed the energy of ocean waves, temperature, currents, or tides to power turbines and generate electricity. Tidal generators convert the movement of current into energy. They have not been developed yet on a large scale, but they're in the beginning stages in Ireland and Norway. Another option is ocean thermal conversion, OTs. It uses different water temperatures at at least 77 degrees Fahrenheit to run an engine. It uses the ocean temperature gradient, of warmer water on top and colder at the bottom. Warm surface water is used to evaporate a working fluid 
The vaporized fluid then powers an engine. The condenser of the engines, heat exchangers, which use cooling agents to convert the steam from its gaseous to its liquid state, uses cold ocean water from the ocean's floor. Some places in use of this technology are Japan and in the US, Hawaii. Human creativity is developing a solidity gradient power called osmosis power. It is the energy that uses fresh water as a power while entering into salt water. This technology will be a good option for delta areas where rivers and oceans meet. Now that we've covered the ocean's importance, we know it is not just water, it's life. It is part of our life support system. We need the ocean to have life on planet Earth. If we don't take care of it, there will be a lot of bad effects. We must take care of it by managing a healthy marine environment that supports a balanced ecosystem in a way where we can still continue to use the ocean's resources more consciously. This is a challenging job and process. Still, we must act fast. We humans can create change with our ingenuity. Remember, implement solutions to stop pollution. Gabby. Alright, we have two more presenters, with the next one being Aiden, who will talk about invasive species in Florida. One second, we have images. Florida, Florida, Florida is a beautiful state, bordered on the west by the Gulf of Mexico, the east by the Atlantic Ocean, and with nearly 6 million acres of wildlife management areas in between, it is the outdoor enthusiast dream. But Florida has a dark secret, and I'm not talking Florida has a dark secret, and I'm not talking about the climate change, pollution, or even the Florida man. I'm talking about invasive species. Invasive species cost the U.S. $120 billion annually in control of damaged fees. Florida's warm climate has allowed it to become the nation's uh, leading state in the amount of invasive species. So invasive species typically arrive in new places by hitchhiking on ships as part of a pet trade um, to be kept in zoos or to be used as livestock. The so problems start to happen once they've uh, escaped or been released and they start to breed and grow and spread. The reason that they're able to spread as they do is because they typically have no um, predators in their new range. Um, so invasive species create unnecessary and harmful competition to the native species of the areas by taking their food, taking their habitat, uh, and in some extreme cases, eating them to the point of destination. Before I continue, I want to make one thing clear. Invasive and non-native species are not the same thing. Non-native species do not cause harm to their new uh, range. They either have a positive or no effect at all. While invasive species, uh, they damage or cause harm to their new range. It would take much uh, too much time to speak of all of Florida's invasive species. I'm just going to get into what I consider Florida's most, or should I say, least important species. First is the green iguana. So, when I say they're everywhere in South Florida, it's not an exaggeration. If 
there's a body of water and there's probably enough water that you can find around it. They were first brought or found in, in, the, in South Florida in the 1960s and they are native to South and Central America as well as some parts of the Caribbean. So they were brought here by the pet trade to be sold as pets and uh, it is also believed that they may have hitchhiked on incoming cargo ships. Luckily, even though their population has become a problem in South Florida, uh, temperatures in North and Central Florida are too cold for them to survive. You might be thinking to yourself, what problems can these little green lizards cause? Well, first off, uh, iguanas create burrows. These burrows can cause infrastructure damage like eroding sidewalks, clogging the collapsed canal banks, and in some serious cases, uh, even causing um, building structures to fail and uh, sometimes collapse. So they've also been observed to eat tree snails at Billback State Park. Uh, this could potentially show that they could cause uh, harm to native and endangered tree snail populations. So they also eat nicker bean, which is an important host plant for the Miami blue butterfly, which is a native species. Without this plant, um, the Miami blue butterfly could potentially go extinct. So, like many other reptiles, they can also spread salmonella. Next on the list is the lionfish. So, the lionfish, like the reefs uh, in Florida and the surrounding waters, they were first discovered in 1985 by Damien Beach, and since then, they spread as far north as North Carolina, as far west as Texas, and east past the Caribbean. It's believed they got to our waters by uh, escaping and being released from the aquarium tank. Even though they can only reach a maximum of 18 inches, they can still cause a lot of damage. They've been known to eat prey up to half their size, as well as eat um, over 70 marine invertebrate species. These species include juvenile parrotfish, snapper, blooper, and, important, and other important uh, prey species for the native uh, fish. The reason that they've been able to spread as far as they have, like many other uh, invasive species on this list, because they have no natural predators in Florida. Third is the cane or buco toad. They're all over Florida, but mainly in South and Central Florida. They were first brought here in the 1930s to control pests on sugar cane farms. Uh, their population didn't truly become a problem until the 50s and 60s. After they, had become, after they had began uh, being released from the pet trade. So, like many other species, they create competition for the native species, uh, particularly in this case, amphibians. Uh, they take uh, important breeding ground, they eat the food, things of that nature. They also uh, have the ability to secrete poison when they feel threatened, which many dogs and native species have fallen victim to. Personally, my dog has not been her fair share of uh, cane toads, but she's been okay. But if, if you don't re uh, recognize it fast enough, it can be fatal. Their eggs are also toxic, which is bad news for a native species looking for their next meal. Next is the bullseye snakehead. So before I get into the species, I want to make uh, one thing about the one thing. So the picture on the right it shows the bowfin and the bullseye snakehead. The bowfin is a native species that closely resembles the bullseye snakehead, but as the picture shows, the main difference is the anal fin. Uh, the bullseye snakehead's anal fin is much longer than that of the dolphin. Snakehead are only found, uh, bullseye snakehead are only found in South Florida, as temperatures over, water temperatures over 50 degrees are fatal to them. They're from the tropical region of, of Asia, and it's not completely known how or why they arrived in Florida, but the most commonly accepted is they're brought here in the and they're very popular to eat back in Asia, and some believe that they even have medicinal properties. So they have virtually no predators in uh, South Florida, and they eat just about anything that moves, which um, causes problems to all sorts of native species like frogs uh, and fish, particularly. So personally, in the waters that I fish, um, I've seen much more snakehead than I have uh, right now, which is a native species. And speaking of fishing, if you want to catch one, you can hit just about any of them. But some part of the box work particularly well. Uh, fourth is the our feral hogs wild pigs. So 
They've been here much longer than all the other species on the list. It's believed that they're a lot here as far back as 1500s by Hernando de Soto. They're native to Europe or the old world. They're found, they're found in every Florida county and uh, the population of Florida is second in the nation over behind Texas. Even though they're in every Florida county, the densest population exists west and north of Lake Okeechobee. They are known to carry ticks, fleas, tuberculosis, parasitic worms, and other things of that nature. And they create competition for the native uh, mammals of the world, like squirrels, deer, and turkey. Although they, they do cause harm like this, the main problem that they uh, cause has to do with the agricultural industry. They're known to trample crops, eat the young, eat the young livestock, and contaminate water. They also root or dig for their food, which causes the destabilization of soil, which can cause agricultural damage as well as harm. So, feral hogs cost the U.S. $2.5 billion annually to control and damage trees. Next up is the Brazilian pepper tree. So, the Brazilian pepper tree was brought here in the 1840s as an ornamental plant. They're native to South America and they can grow up to 30 feet tall and live up to 30 years. So, to people with sensitive skin, People who are allergic to plants such as poison ivy or poison oak, they um, it can cause dermatitis, which is a skin condition. Uh, Brazilian pepper tree is also known to cause respiratory issues, especially to those uh, who have asthma during uh, during their blooming season. So the biggest problem that they cause is that they create a thick canopy over the ground, which essentially drowns out the native species in shade. Brazilian pepper trees can be found in both aquatic and terrestrial habitats. Last, but most definitely not least, is the Burmese python. The, this is probably the most harmful species on this list. They're native to Southeast Asia, and they're brought here by the Indian pet trade. Their population didn't become a problem until after Hurricane Andrew, when a, a breeding facility was destroyed releasing an unknown but very large number of snakes into the surrounding swamps uh, in the Everglades. So it's unknown how exactly how many uh, snakes, uh, python, live in the Everglades, but it's estimated somewhere around 100 to 300 now. The Florida record is only 18 feet 9 inches, but in the native range, they're known to grow up to 26 feet and weigh over 200 pounds. Their diet mainly consists of small mammals, and they've been linked to the uh, population decline of such small mammals, uh, like mainly rabbit and raccoon. They also observe to eat the endangered uh, key larva wood rat, as well as some alligators, and they have no native species in Florida. So now I want to get into some methods to control the native species I've talked about, uh, why they're bad. Now, uh, let's just get into how we can help with this problem. So, there are three main ways of controlling native species mechanically, biologically, and chemically. Mechanically is basically doing, yourself, doing it yourself, like hunting, fishing, cultivating, or pulling. Biologically is the use of predators to control native species. And chemically is the use of herbicides, pesticides, and poisons. Uh, now I want to talk about how these methods have been implemented in Florida in particular. So FWC, or Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Committee, usually uses more mechanical attempts, uh, particularly, particularly um, trying to get the public involved, uh, whether it be fishing on tape or just removing invasive species from their properties. They've also held, held tournaments in the case of the lionfish, uh, which is a fun way to get the public involved and uh, provide an incentive to see who can catch the most. So they've also used more biological attempts, especially one obvious example is the peacock bass or the peacock cichlid. They were brought here to uh, control you know, non-native and invasive uh, cichlid species. And so far it's worked out very well. They've done their job. They haven't uh, spread out of control. So unfortunately, uh, once a species becomes too large, these methods really don't work. So for most of the species that I spoke of before, uh, it's too late for these methods to actually uh, have any effect. The best way to keep them out of our environment is just to just uh, the best way the best way to control them is just to keep them out of our environment in the first place. This can be done by uh, creating strict laws and regulations, 
uh, regarding the importation and keeping of exotic animals. Laws like these, regulations like these, were put in place for the uh, Burmese python. By the time that they took them back, they really couldn't do anything. So what can you do to help out? One thing that you can do is help out with eradication efforts like fishing, hunting, or finding a way to donate to an organization that does such things. But if you don't feel comfortable doing this, if you don't feel comfortable uh, killing, an, killing an animal or uh, providing means for somebody to do it, that's perfectly fine as well. The best thing you can do is not release your exotic pets into the wild. There's a program in Florida called the Exotic Pet Amnesty Program, which finds homes for surrendered uh, exotic pets. So please, if you cannot um, take care of your exotic pet anymore, find it a suitable home, give it to this program. Um, just don't release it. Don't cause a mess that you can't clean up yourself. Thank you. All right, thank you, Aiden. Last but not least is Brody, who will be talking about her passion for blacksmithing. It all started with one boring summer. I had nothing to do. Every day was another movie or another episode of Riverdale. My mom always told me to go outside and do something, otherwise I'd become a lazy sack of potatoes. But if you know Florida, you know that it's almost instant death if you go outside during the summers. In South Florida, the average temperature is usually between 88 and 91 degrees, but it can reach temperatures of 99 or over 100 in the sun. One day, my mom said, hey, wanna go to a summer camp? My very first thought was school over summer, but instead, I brought myself to my senses and I asked her what she had in mind. My mom said it was gonna be something fun. So I interpreted that as an art camp or something else. But later that week, I found out she had signed me up for blacksmithing. Like, come on, I wanted to stay out of the heat, not slowly and painfully melt to death. But there was no going back. She had already paid for it. It was the day of the camp. It already started out bad because I had to wake up at 7.30 in the morning and that was a big change from my usual 11 o'clock. But I was getting dressed for, school, for, for my camp when my mom told me I had to wear jeans just when I thought it couldn't get any worse. So there I was at my blacksmithing camp with a bunch of people I didn't know in 100 degree temperatures, not knowing how to do anything. And it 
it was bad. I didn't know what to do. It, I was very stressed at that moment, but luckily it was a beginner's camp, so no one knew how to do anything. But once I received some instruction, I began to hit the heated metal and it just came so naturally for me. It was magical. A gas propane forage can reach temperatures of 1,900 degrees to 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Iron doesn't begin to glow until it is almost 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, iron can be 900 degrees and still a dark gray color. In a blacksmith workshop, you have to test any metal before you pick it up with your hands or anything because you never know, it might be 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Iron doesn't begin to glow until it's a deep red color, then it goes to an orange, to a yellow, and finally a bright white. If your metal turns into a bright white, that usually means it's melting or boiling. If your piece of metal is melting, it most likely is shooting off little droplets of boiling metal everywhere. These droplets range from between 2,900 degrees and above. This only happens in coal forges though. But like I said, we had to wear jeans. But that was for safety, to protect our legs. And we also had to wear safety glasses to protect our eyes from any piece of metal flying in them because a trip of a metal in your eye would easily be a trip to the emergency room. We also had to wear 100% cotton. Well, this was because polyester would just simply melt. You would begin to strike your piece of metal when it's a vibrant orange color. So it would be 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. When striking metal, small pieces of metal will fly off. This is called scale. Scale is caused by the oxidation of the metal. Oxidation happens when a hot piece of metal comes into contact with cold air rapidly. If a piece of scale lands on you, um, the pain will only last for about two seconds, and that's about it. But after a while, you'll start to get used to it, and you won't notice the scale hitting you. But every once in a while, you'll have a big hunk of scale hit you, and you'll jump at the spark of it. So there I was, an 11-year-old girl, bending, hammering, manipulating metal to make whatever I wanted. I was shook. It came so naturally for me, and I didn't know why. Mm, well, this might be a stretch, but I have Viking blood in me. And to my knowledge, Vikings did a lot of blacksmithing. They would make knives, nails, weapons, and much more. Um, you might be wondering where the word blacksmith came from. Well, the first part of the word, black, represents how dirty a person gets while working the forge, or the heated metal, after the heated metal cools, it has a layer of scale on it, and that's also black. And the second part of the word smith comes from the word smite, which means to strike with a firm blow. Black, so I was blacksmithing away when I saw a red glowing spark fly through the air and land on my arm. I remember it burning so badly. It was sizzling, but of course I didn't let that stop me. And by the end of three fun, fun, but gruesome hours of hard work, I had my first ever creation, a leaf. I know it doesn't seem like a lot now, but I was so excited. My mom, my mom came to pick me up and I ran over to hug her and show her what I made. But before I could, she stopped me. She told me to go look in a mirror. So I did what I was told and oh boy, was I dirty. I had grime all over me. So when I came back from the bathroom after trying to wipe all that off me, I found her looking at the leaf and she loved it. She was so excited. We ended up putting leather string on it and making it into a necklace. When we got home that day, I was so anxious for the next day because we were gonna make a hook. Here's what the hook looks like. We're going to make a hook. And finally, we were going to make a knife. Finally, 
only a knife. I learned so many new names of tools and techniques that week. Some of them that I used to make the leap were the fuller, the swage block, ball peen hammer, and finally the horn of the anvil. A fuller is a hammer with a thin side to it. It is used to spread the piece of metal. A swage block is a giant block with, that you use to dish metal. To dish metal, you would lay your piece of metal in one of the indentations in the giant block. Whichever side you would want inwards, you would have that facing up towards you, and you would strike it with a ball peen hammer. A ball peen hammer is a normal hammer, but instead of having a slot bean, it has a ball peen. Finally, we used the horn of the anvil for the tapered stem we had created for our leaf, and we bent it into a loop. So now, I've been doing blacksmithing for two and a half years. It has become a lot easier for me to strike the piece of metal with the desired part of the hammer. Projects have become a lot easier for me. I've required very little or no instruction at all to create things. I've also learned many more techniques while blacksmithing. I've also learned how to weld and how to grind. And I've recently brought my dad into blacksmithing. He really enjoys it too. Some of my mo more recent projects are candelabras, candelabras. Here's my candelabra. This was designed and created by me. Okay. Then, then we have the metal rose. Here's my metal rose. Okay. Um, and finally, a dagger. Okay. I was given this opportunity by a place called the Guild. So if I've interested anyone, the Guild is located in Pompano Beach, Florida. Anyways, hopefully, I'll be able to continue my journey and you had fun following me on my journey that I've had so far. I hope everyone has a great day. By the way, I'm a blacksmith. What's your superpower? Thank you. Thank you so much, Rowan. I would also like to thank everyone for tuning in today. And sorry, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in today. And a special thank you to the audio team for the help for the help in production of today's event. Now, before you go, there is one more. So we are currently raising money for cancer research through Remake for Life, and we are trying to raise money for our ABA projects. So if you look below into the chat, you will find a link to it. If you can find it through all of those people's names. Yeah. But yeah, anyways, thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice day.